now by introducing um, our panel for this morning, but also by welcoming you all here to our first um, ROSL webinar. Um, it's been a very steep learning curve, I think, for all of us this last few weeks, um, and particularly um, in terms of putting on a webinar. So this is our first attempt. So please um, bear with us as we learn how to do this. Um, the format for today is that um, Martin Ashley and Francesco Basso from Martin Ashley Architects will be making a presentation on the um, Royal Overseas League towards a master building plan for Overseas House. There will be an opportunity to either send in questions during the meeting, which the panel will be able to see, um, which you can do by accessing the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen, or it might be in different places on different tablets and things. And you can send a question in during the presentation to the panel and we'll collate these and try and answer these at the end. However, I would suggest that you do try and listen carefully to the presentation um, rather than be distracted by, by um, sending in questions. Um, we're also recording today's meeting so that we can put it online and share it with those people who haven't been able to join us today. So um, if you don't want to, you won't be on screen unless you're um, asked to speak at some point or that uh, we get to that point. So hopefully you're all happy with that. Um, and I just wanted to say a very big thank you to Martin and to Francesco for, for putting this um, presentation together for us today. Um, as you know, from the moment I joined the Royal Overseas League at the end of 2017, the buildings have been a major challenge, partly resulting from the enormous backlog of repair and maintenance work that's needed, but also the challenge of um, trying to ensure that we make the best of our Grade 1 listed buildings and really make them sing and come alive through their history and their wonderful unique characteristics. So I was very, very pleased last summer to go through a tendering exercise, which led to the appointment of um, Martin Ashley Architects as our retained architects and to develop this master building strategy with us. Um, so that everything we do in the future is prioritized, thought through and integrated and also respects the heritage that we are the custodians of for the nation. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Martin and to Francesca, but I just wanted to tell you a couple of things about them. Um, Martin has practiced as a specialist historic buildings conservation architect for more than 40 years, and he's advised clients on the conservation and development of grade one listed buildings and scheduled ancient monuments for organizations, including the Royal Household, the Crown Estate, the Royal Parks Agency, historic royal palaces, English heritage, the City of London Corporation, and many other government and local government agencies and charitable trusts. Martin founded his own practice in 1994 and works from their office in Twickenham in West London, which is just a short tube journey from Rosal. Martin's team are entirely comprised of qualified and accredited conservation professionals including his colleague Francesca Basso, who's a very experienced conservation architect working with Martin and on our webinar panel this morning. Francesco Basso is an architect with a master's degree in the conservation of historic buildings and joined Martin Ashley Architects in 2011. She cultivated her passion for heritage buildings while working on projects at Windsor Castle, Hampton Court Palace, Clifford's Tower, Newark Castle, the City of London, Alexandra Palace and Eton College. So as you can see, we're very, very fortunate to have um, Francesca and Martin with us this morning. I'm now going to hand over to Martin. Diana, thank you so much for that, for that um, really lovely introduction. Um, I have to say it's incredible to hear the, the uh, list of buildings and clients that we've worked for. Where on earth does all of that time go? I have no idea, but I know that we do thoroughly enjoy ourselves and we're thoroughly enjoying ourselves looking at Overseas House, which is a really smashing building. And we're loving working with uh, Diana and her executive team upon it. Um, Francesca has put an awful lot of work into putting together this presentation and I hope that you enjoy it 
I shall do most of the talking as, as, as I tend to do, unfortunately, um, but Francesca is very welcome to chip in anytime she likes. It was really interesting to see um, uh, the Russell archivist, Mark Brearley's um, call notice for this webinar because he put together um, some rolling images of um, uh, overseas house um, images from before and the same spaces as they are now. And it was very compelling actually to see those images because the changes there are exactly what it is that we're interested in. What there was before and what, what, has, what has vanished in the intervening time. So we're going to talk to you about, about some of that now. Well, um, uh, Charles, have I got my screen shared there? Is that all right? I think we have, unless somebody tells me otherwise, I'll, I'll assume that everybody can see the screen. So we have here a list of some bullet points and re these really are the way that um, as a practice, as a um, architectural practice, we always go about working with wonderful historic buildings. And the first bullet point, which we'll talk to you about in a moment, is to understand the significance of the building. And that term significance is very important in terms of historic building legislation and achieving statutory consents for any alterations that Russell might want to carry out to its building. We have to understand the significance and understand how we're not going to harm that significance by anything that we're going to do. The second bullet point is understanding the condition of, of the building. Well, that's a given, isn't it, really? So in, uh, at the end of 2019 and early 2020, we've looked very hard at the building fabric, the, the damp and decay and, and uh, the, any, any problems with the infrastructure, um, and also the way that the building perhaps doesn't work as, as it might best do for the benefit of the membership. We, we then go on to uh, consider um, principles of possible improvement. So how in this complex historic building might it be possible to carry out beneficial changes to improve the overseas house offer to its membership and how to, and, uh, how to go about that. We then, of course, look at immediately urgent repairs and we've popped in a couple of case studies on that at the end of this presentation. And you'll be pleased to know that in this COVID-19 lockdown situation where your membership, where your club is closed, um, perversely, that's a golden opportunity to actually carry out um, some works which um, can be done uh, when, the mem when the building is empty. And so I can tell you that your executive team and your technical teams are working extremely hard on the building at the moment, getting what work can be done um, uh, done in the lockdown time that is available. Then we go on as a practice and we look at from our understanding of the significance of the building, our understanding of the condition of the building, our understanding of improvements that might be able to be made, um, we look at what can be next steps and opportunities. So let's start to talk to you about some of this now. So the understanding of the building. To understand the significance of any historic building that we approach, the first thing that we do is dive into the archives and we've dived into your archives and with Mark Brearley's uh, excellent help, we've investigate, investigated Russell's archives, which are brilliant. Um, but a lot of it tends to be, if you like, um, social archive as opposed to bricks and mortar type archive. And for the bricks and mortar stuff, we've gone into other archives, um, the sort of the principal London archives, such as the City of Westminster archive, the London Metropolitan Archive, and then others such as the Ashmolean Museum, which actually has been very productive. Um, and then with that information, we've produced a heritage statement, which is the document you see on the left of your screen. And this has been produced by uh, Elizabeth Moore, who we've worked with um, forever, actually. She's an independent consultant, but Elizabeth and ourselves always work together. And she's done a terrific job producing a heritage statement which tells us and you 
all about your all about overseas house how this building has come to be as you see it now and it's a, it's an interesting fascinating and complex story i believe that this heritage statement uh, has been well received by by your executive and I'm, I'm proud enough to say that it may be the best understanding of the buildings of Overseas House, which has been produced for some time. Now I say buildings, um, uh, not building, because the key point to understand about Overseas House is that it's actually three buildings, not one. Um, and so um, let me talk to you about that. So we know that um, St. James's, the area where your club is, developed as an area of high class private housing, um, developed in the hinterland around St. James's Palace, the Royal Palace. And it developed as fashionable London moved away from the city and more towards the, the leafy western suburbs, and particularly here, um, uh, the particularly leafy western reaches border, bordering onto Henry VIII's Green Park. And I say Henry VIII's Green Park because he did create Green Park, which you look out onto from Overseas House. It's all part of his hunting parks that he developed around all of his uh, royal palaces. So you have that really very remarkable piece of history to think about every time you look out of a window at the back of Overseas House. The Overseas House facades looking onto Green Park cannot be overestimated in terms of their compelling historic significance and that's terribly important. Now I, I, I say facades because um, as I've mentioned to you already um, these grade one buildings and the whole of Overseas House is grade one listed the highest protection that a listed building can have in statutory terms. Um, and this is what I'm showing you in the red line area in the screen that you're seeing on the left there. And at the bottom uh, left in the red box is Vernon House. And we know that this was built in the 18th century, early 18th century actually, for Admiral Edward Vernon, a very uh, significant um, uh, naval uh, Admiral, but the house was substantially rebuilt in 1835. So much of what you see is actually 19th century, not uh, Admiral Vernon's 18th century building. Um, and it was then substantially refigured again in 1906 for Lord Hillingdon after a very serious fire. It was purchased by the Overseas Club in 1921 and Vernon House in statutory terms is of high heritage significance. Now top left, Rutland House that you see in the red box was built in 1734 as a fine Palladian house for the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk and built for her by the celebrated architect James Gibbs. He was a very significant court architect and he built many wonderful buildings. Now Rutland House, called such because of the Duke of Rutland who moved there later on, was built as 16 Arlington Place, naturally built in the French style, having a, uh, a front coaching courtyard with a gatehouse and entrance archway uh, bordering onto Arlington Street, just around the corner. Now um, Rutland House, as it's known these days, um, was, was bought by the Overseas League and linked to Vernon House in 1934. And Rutland House, because of its um, uh, important occupants, but also the considerable importance of uh, James Gibbs as a significant and very fashionable architect, is of the highest possible heritage significance. And thirdly, um, and by no means least, the Westminster Wing which was constructed by the Overseas League in 1937 in the front coaching courtyard of Rutland House. And the Westminster Wing added uh, a dining hall, um, a conference uh, and a conference room and ballroom, uh, and a banqueting hall, the Hall of India, and two floors of bedrooms. 
Westminster Wing because it's that bit later and actually because it's had extra floors added to it as well is, is in statutory terms of medium heritage significance. Well, let's move on. Here are some images showing the significance of various parts of Overseas House for your interest. And on your top left, you have of some of James Gibbs's early 18th century sketches. Isn't that wonderful that we can see these? And we've got quite a few of these. And these are lodged in the Ashmolean Museum in Cambridge. And so we've, we've found these, we've dug these up. And these sketches that you're looking at are actually elevations of the wrench room, showing um, the splendid decorative plaster work by William Wilton, who was one of James Gibbs's uh, favorite plaster stuccoists, as they were called at that time, and also Gibbs's great glazed lantern. You have one, two wonderful glazed lanterns in Rutland House. This one to the wrench room, as it became known, um, but also to the, your grand staircase, both amazing pieces of work by, by Gibbs. Now, next to the sketches, you have um, Gibbs's uh, fireplace in, in the rent room. That's just to show it to you as it is. But where the door room has, where the door has been punched through to the right hand side of that fireplace into the drawing room, and that opening was knocked through in 1934 when Russell connected the two buildings. Unfortunately, some of Gibbs's and uh, William Wilton's wonderful decorative plaster work was lost in the process. And that has happened around Rutland House, uh, unfortunately. Now this is what tended to happen uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, the, the spirit of architecture was a different spirit in those days. So Rutland House has lost some of its significance. Now, um, on the right hand side, there's a lovely view uh, of um, uh, Vernon House and Rutland House back elevations uh, overlooking Green Park in 1848. And actually those elevations are on the extreme right of your image. Now, um, you, you also have uh, a view of Lord Hillington's library. And sorry, uh, um, extreme right, uh, they're actually underneath pictures of uh, my panel members in this webinar, which is why I couldn't see it. Uh, but we have uh, James Gibbs's Rutland House dining room, a pre-1934 um, uh, photograph and it's now named the Duke of York Bar, and I'll talk to you about that later. Um, bottom right, you have Lord Hillington's library, a pre-1934 uh, photograph, and bottom left, you have a rather wonderful freehand pencil sketch from 1937 of your beautiful drawing room. Now, I think what that sketch shows me is that the drawing room, as you experience it now, has lost a lot of its decorative intensity, a lot of the wonder of that um, actually Regency interior, not a Victorian uh, interior of Lord Hillingdon's time in the early 20th century. This is actually part of um, uh, Lord William Bentinck's Regency interior, early um, uh, um, uh, 18th century. Um, I beg your pardon, late 18th century, and a, a very different period and very decoratively rich. And what you see in this sketch is a very large and elaborate cornice to the ceiling. If you go into the drawing room now, that cornice has completely gone, which is a tragedy in my view. So these are things that are worth discussing. Now here I've flicked up um, some chronological drawings for your interest. Top uh, left, we have a basement plan, and I'll come to that in a minute, but uh, bottom left, you have a ground floor plan, and in orange um, is um, uh, Admiral Vernon's Vernon House, um, much altered in the 19th century, and in yellow at the front of the orange plan of Vernon House is your entrance to your club. It's where you walk in now into your entrance hall. And I, I think that's terrific to see that. On that same ground floor plan, um, top left, 
in the ground floor plan in red, you've got Rutland House. And so that's showing you the earlier building fabric of James Gibbs's Rutland House, 17, um, 1738. And then to the right of that is the Westminster Wing, built in 1937. Now, the wonderful things about these chronicle, chronological drawings that we've um, compiled is that they show us where fabric is, which is less interesting than other fabric, less historically and architecturally important, less significant, perhaps. And so it shows, shows us where in the building there are bits of the building that can be jiggered about with. Um, in order to make subtle changes to improve the way the building operates. Just to go on with uh, this page for uh, one minute, a couple of more pieces of uh, 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 interest, if you like, items of interest. In the top drawing, the basement plan, you'll see uh, going out under your entrance forecourt, um, the orange um, service range, the basement service rooms, and also the kitchens which serve your dining room um, uh, um, and bar. Now they're all underneath your entrance courtyard and they were built um, in, in uh, 1878, uh, did I say, um, uh, when the house was reconstructed and then altered again by, um, uh, um, by Lord Hillingdon when he purchased the house in 1906. On the right, you've got some lovely pencil drawings. And what I love about these drawings uh, is, is that um, they show um, uh, elevations facing Green Park, um, drawn by the architect Ambrose Pointer in 1909, but also uh, elevations at the front, uh, onto your front courtyard, and to the right of those front courtyard elevations are two floor plans and one floor plan shows the staircase before Ambrose Pointer altered it for Lord Hellingdon uh, and the other little floor plan shows the staircase where you see it now uh, as it is now so you walk in through your entrance into your entrance hall and there is your oak staircase and that is Lord Hellingdon's wonderful oak staircase of 1906 rather actually in the, in the baronial style, quite overblown um, in, in a way, but a, but a fine piece. And the other thing which is of interest is that in one of the little floor plans, you show that your entrance hall, which you experience now, has been broken through from um, uh, Lord Hillingdon's oak staircase into what was a library and the wall, that's where your uh, visitor information desks are now and uh, that was a library to the 19th century house but it was all broken through to create one entrance hall and there you see uh, in if I take you back to the orange ground floor floor plan bottom left hand corner you show the vertiginous steps that you have to climb up from the lower ground floor of Vernon House up to the higher ground floor of James Gibbs's wonderful stair hall. Now those steps are purely because the two houses were built at completely different times and at completely different floor levels, which is jolly unhelpful and we'll come to that. Now here are some upper floors uh, and these are the chronological um, floor plans that we've created and so it shows you the orange of Vernon House again, the red of Vernon House, uh, Big Garden, the red of Rutland House again, and the green of the Westminster wing again. But the little plans at the bottom are interesting because they show that as you go up the building, um, the colors change. And what they're showing is that um, uh, a lot of rebuilding has been done. And do you see the, the pale blue, which is actually the fourth floor of um, the Parkside rooms? That's your Parkside bedrooms which were completely rebuilt because they were bomb damaged in World War II. And then uh, dark blue and mauve of the top of the Westminster wing, those are floors that were added in 1968 and 2003 is the mauve. And so this is the chronology of your, of your building. 
um, uh, but there's more. Let's move on. Now these drawings are recreations um, which we've been able to take from a rather wonderful book which is shown on the right hand side of your screen. And the book is an autobiography of Lady Diana Cooper and she wrote it in 1958 and it's called The Rainbow Comes and Goes and it's her recollections of her childhood growing up in Rutland House. Isn't that wonderful? And she describes every single room in Rutland House. And so, for example, bottom left, the Duke of York's bar, as you know it now, was for her William Kent decorated dining room. Now, William Kent was a highly significant um, architect who specialised in the early 18th century in very decorative interiors for the, for the well-to-do. And so it's not entirely proven, but it's thought that Kent uh, may well have been active in your building. And she shows as well uh, the bar seating area, which is your, the Duke of York's um, bar lounge. Uh, she calls that a, a library for my father, the sunny parkside room. Comparatively noiseless, she says, on the Sunday evenings in the summer when the military band played uh, Pinafore in the park uh, bandstand. Wonderfully evocative. Uh, she talks about the inner hall, James Gibbs's inner hall, which she refers to as a darkish pillared hall. And it was dark because it was buried in the middle of Rutland House. And to the right of it was her visitor entrance. And she refers to a vast house of exquisite proportions. And she goes on to talk about that, which I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, and she refers to a bright light morning room, which um, uh, um, Diana Cooper refers to as her large morning room. And then I'll go up again. And so these are smaller plans, um, but Diana Co Cooper refers um, uh, in the um, top left hand plan to her gilded drawing room looking out over Green Park. And she refers to the fact that um, the Duchess of Norfolk uh, commissioned the finest fireplace in the house by um, uh, um, John Michael Reisbrack. Now Reisbrack was a phenomenal sculptor in marble and he was commissioned by the uh, well-to-do to create fine marble pieces. And your fireplace in the Rutland room is a Reisbrack fireplace. Phenomenally important. This is an incredibly important piece of work. And you have this in your clubhouse. So this is part of, all part of the, the rich tapestry of the history of Rutland House. But there is a dark side, I have to tell you, to the history. And the dark side is the demolition photographs that you see in the bottom of this page. And the right-hand photograph is the front of Rutland House with uh, demolition works starting, which is worrying, isn't it? And you see some men perched perilously on, the, uh, on top to the right of Rutland House there. And even more perilously, perilously you see some uh, workmen standing on some unsupported bits of timber just above the entrance door. Uh, health and safety in those days didn't mean what it does now. I would be shot and Francesca would be shot if we tried to get away with um, work, work people working in those ways. But really, really importantly, the left-hand photo is the front of Rutland House with the whole front range of rooms torn away. And this is what happened in 1937 when the Westminster Wing was built in the coaching courtyard of Rutland House. Now on the left, you see the front of Vernon House and um, uh, you can see uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the um, uh, windows to the rooms that you stand in and you, you, you know so well and you see the entrance to Vernon House. But the front of Rutland House has gone and the, the um, door which you see not the ver at the very bottom, but the next floor up, there's a little door, and that's the door that you walk through now from your uh, James Gibbs's fine um, staircase hall, and you walk from your staircase uh, through that doorway into the Westminster Wing 
landing and staircase. How incredible. Um, the left hand door just to the left of that, actually that's still there because Francesca went around tapping the plasterwork and it tapped hollow. That opening actually is still there, but it's all blocked up. And above that, there are two doors which are very significant. The two dark doors, the right hand door goes to the top landing of your grand staircase, James Gibbs's wonderful staircase, which is all still there. And it's cloaked in a, in a dark protection in this demolition photograph. And the left hand doorway, that dark doorway goes into the wrench room. And you can just see the pitched roof of uh, James Gibbs's wonderful lantern to the, the rent room. So this is a quite remarkable piece of building history. And this is what happened. So there's the um, same photograph again, top left. And then to the right of it, here is your new Westminster wing, which actually in 1937, the date of this sketch, was a fine set piece of very late arts and crafts work with some wonderful interiors. And on the right, you've got a, an excellent sketch um, of the Hall of India, which actually is bashed around and knocked around and heavily used now. And you walk in and you think, gosh, this could do with cheering up. But it's, it's a very finely pitched piece of late arts and crafts architecture, which deserves really bringing back and celebrating. Then the photographs at the bottom, the black and white photographs, are actually showing you um, the later additions that have occurred since. So since the 1937 Westminster Wing was built, you had additional belt bedrooms. You've had two floors of extra bedrooms uh, built on top. And then actually a third, the very top floor of the Westminster Wing rooms, if you've ever stayed in those, you, you can recognize that those rooms feel and look quite different. And that's because they were built in 2003. The architects were very clever and built a very um, lightly framed structure so as not to overload the foundations. Um, uh, um, and so you've got actually three extra floors of bedrooms uh, than were there in um, 1937 wonderful chronology and it's terribly important to know all of this. Now I'm going to go on and talk briefly about the condition of overseas house um, and this is part of what we have to do. This is uh, item number two on the bullet point in the opening slide that you saw. We look hard at what is the condition of the building. And what I want you to understand in this is that some um, worrying slides that I show you and here are some of them, um, are part and parcel of the fact that actually poor old overseas house hasn't had a very significant overhaul since the Westminster Wing was built in 1937. It's had some works done, but the problem is that the principal infrastructure of 1937, look at all of those drain pipes and, and uh, ugly cabling, and the crittle windows, which you see in one of the little bottom wind, uh, photographs there. The crittle windows are metal windows and they're in a bad state. Now, crittle windows are celebrated, believe it or not. Um, uh, we know them very well. You can still get them. The crittle company is still running. But crittle produced an awful lot of windows for uh, what were considered highly fashionable buildings at the time in the 1930s, 1930s. And so although they're in a shocking state, your crittle windows, and you've got an awful lot of them in overseas house, they're in a very poor state because they're metal, they're rusted, they don't work properly, they're decoratively in very poor condition as you see. You see some uh, bad slating, which is by far and away the worst area of roof um, that we found on overseas house. So I had to show you that. Uh, photograph and shock you all, didn't I? But um, uh, there, there are plenty of roofing problems. And here are some more problems on the left. The um, services infrastructure, the pipework, your heating system. Your heating system is elderly. It's, um, some of it do, does go back to the 1930s. Some of, it, some, of the, some of it is 1950s. Some of it is more modern, like on the roof of the Westminster wing that you see there, um, that top middle photograph. 
But a problem that we have, that rather orangey looking photograph, orangey coloured photograph, is that fire compartmentation really um, is of a standard from um, uh, earlier decades and desperately needs bringing up to speed um, to make Overseas House uh, comply with modern legislation. And then bottom photograph, you have mouldering brickwork. And this is just when works were carried out in the 1950s. Um, they didn't think terribly cleverly about weathering details. And so the water does get into Overseas House. And so you have damp and you have decay. And we've looked at all of this and we've put this into a long schedule uh, of, of um, uh, building condition, which we've prioritized priorities one to six. And that is giving your uh, executive team um, and your uh, excellent um, uh, director of, of um, uh, technical director of your estate, Thomas Sikorsky, who's already getting to grips with all of this and doing as much as he can achieve during this COVID lockdown period. Here is some more decay. Now these are James Gibbs's wonderful and historically staggeringly important lanterns. Um, because actually, I've forgotten to tell you something about uh, Rutland House and the both of these lanterns that you see in these photographs are Rutland House um, uh, lanterns. Now James Gibbs London townhouses have all been demolished. Your building, Rutland House, is the only one left. It's unbelievable. So these great lanterns of James Gibbs's are the last surviving Gibbs London townhouse great lanterns in existence at all. This is the compelling significance of Overseas House. And looking hard at these two lanterns and you've got on the top left, you've got the rent room lantern. I'm worried about bulging and defam defamation under the cladding lead work. In the middle layer, you've got the grand stair lantern. and the bottom, you've got rotten timbers and the grand stair lantern, there's a fair amount of rot. And if we don't catch it quickly, it's going to be in a really bad state because wet rot gives you dry rot. And if you get dry rot, you're in big trouble because it goes everywhere. We're also worried, just as an aside, that the archive for right-hand photos needs a better home. The archive, the last thing that it needs is sunshine and light. We need to find an overseas house, a good archive store, so that Mark can manage your archives properly for the Royal Overseas League. Moving on, your house, overseas house, has presentational issues. Now, isn't this fascinating? The left-hand um, photographs are not overseas house, but they are James Gibbs interiors. How can that be? This is a house in um, Henrietta Street uh, in London. But these rooms of 1723 to 27 are the last surviving rooms in that house by James Gibbs. But they were rescued when the house was demolished. And these interiors are now in the Victoria and Adam, uh, I beg your pardon, the Victoria uh, and Albert Museum in London, which is a, uh, a, signif a, uh, a significant um, fact in why James Gibbs is such an important architect and you have the only surviving London townhouse by James Gibbs in existence. A wonderful photograph, a wedding photograph on the right hand side. Um, here is Lady Diana Cooper on her wedding day in 1999. I beg your pardon, no, 1919. Um, isn't that a beautiful photograph? But to the right of that, when the Westminster Wing was built, this is what happened. Those are the same two doors as in the photograph of um, Lady Diana Cooper. So this was the spirit of the age then. But wow, what a massive loss to Rutland House. The amount of uh, beautiful Gibbs joinery, beautifully detailed um, Wilton stucco plasterwork, um, the delight and joy of those interiors. Now you have got a number of good Gibbs interiors, but they've tended to lose detail. At the bottom, you've got something which is a, a, a tragic loss. 
You've got the dining room, which you know as the Duke of York bar in the black and white photograph, a complete Gibbs interior with its door cases, its Wilton beautiful plaster work and cornice work, and this fantastic um, James Gibbs fireplace, which has gone. And there is the Duke of York bar, uh, bottom right. Now this is part of the spirit of the time, but what I'm saying to you is that I feel a compelling sense of loss. And what I would like to help the Royal Overseas League is not to be slavish in its reconstruction of Gibbs interiors, but to celebrate the wonderful chronology that you have and where it's appropriate, bring back some of that wonderful lost detail um, uh, so that the story of the whole of Overseas House and all three of its incredibly significant buildings in their own way um, can be celebrated and that history can be known, seen and thoroughly enjoyed by all of you as members of the Royal Overseas League. So there are, um, uh, if you like, operational presentational issues. The fact that top left hand corner you've lost William Wilton plaster work, the next photo to it, the heating in overseas house just isn't good enough. It's too old. It needs upgrading and improving so you don't have trailing flexes and ad hoc uh, radiators standing around. Now Thomas Sikorsky is getting on with some of this and he's power flushing the entire system during this COVID lockdown period so that should help. But I know that some of you listening will have had problems with heating in bedrooms. The house just doesn't overseas house just isn't heated well enough. Now your information desk, um, uh, next photo along, is actually in a former library um, in the, Vic uh, the Victorian interior to um, overseas house and it's a personal thing but I think that space could be presented in a far more compelling way, evocative of the history of this remarkable building which you thoroughly enjoy being members of. To the right of that, the Westminster, Westminster Wing staircase and landings. It's a remarkable set piece in its own, of its own time. It too is, needs celebrating, needs decorating and presenting and carpeting and thoroughly enjoying as a, as a set piece of um, 1930s late arts and crafts architecture. It will be of the highest significance in a hundred years time. It's just that we're too close to it at the moment to see it as that, but it's a very good piece. Let me guarantee it to you. Bottom left hand corner, here is um, the Dowager, Dowager Duchess of Norfolk's wonderful um, Risebrack marble fireplace, burnt by chemicals, burnt by overzealous cleaning of, of very well-meaning people who wanted to clean it up, it was looking grubby. But what they didn't know is that the sort of chemicals that often get used for cleaning burns marble. So can we find a way to pull those burnt scorch marks out of the marble, poultice it generally, improve the appearance of this compellingly important piece of um, John Michael Reisbrack sculpture. And then other interiors that you know, the fourth floor um, critical corridor, which actually um, you know, is not a wonderfully enjoyable environment for you to use, but it has its historic significance. Can we present it in a much more enjoyable and thermally satisfactory way? It's a jolly cold corridor. Can we present the other historic spaces so that there isn't a clutter of um, uh, door closers and fire signage and, and that sort of thing? which can damage the enjoyment of how spaces are, are presented. Externally as well, just a couple of points because I need to wind up quickly for you now. Um, the frontage of Vernon House, the entrance to your club, there's that lovely photograph with a delightful pre-war car in the front courtyard. But here's that same photograph with your uh, Russell Red Banner and below the banner are the improved entrance steps to the Westminster Wing. 
with with um, 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 a uh, a stair climber for the for the less able, the less ambulant members. Now, I I have to say to you, as a historic buildings architect, we can find a way of doing these things better, because the way that's been done, it's very understandable. It serves a purpose, but actually, in my view, it's very damaging to the compelling importance historically uh, and the the visual enjoyment of the of overseas house uh, by the members we can find a better way of uh, of arranging that staircase we can find a better way of uh, achieving uh, accessibility around the whole of overseas house actually now the front courtyard you're aware the the precinct wall there is grubby the front gates are rotten, the black gates to the right there. Bottom right, you see one of the Ulster Room photographs, this wonderful, this really surprising suite of two rooms, which we discovered during our research. We didn't understand what these um, um, uh, um, stained glass windows were, this heraldry of uh, towns in Ulster. But this is the, um, this was created by um, Evelyn Wrench um, as the, the Ulster Suite. This was the uh, Ulster Rooms and the Empire Newspaper Room. These were reading rooms for members and that's what the stained glass is doing there. Now these rooms are currently uh, the membership um, uh, room and I can't quite remember, oh, the, arts, um, uh, the arts office I think. Are there uses that we can find for these rooms which can bring the enjoyment uh, of those rooms back? They face immediately onto the garden. Can we find a way that those rooms can actually be opened into the garden? Wouldn't that be wonderful for you? And here are the inevitable front courtyard photographs, bottom left, car parking. Can it be done without? Obviously, um, uh, service uses. Um, uh, skips for construction work, but also services. But a left hand photograph at the bottom of the big kitchen duct rising up to the roof. Can we find a more attractive way of doing that? There are lots of things, which is what Francesca and I spend all our lives thinking about on wonderful buildings. Can we find more seemly ways of doing things so that they enhance the enjoyment? And here is a slide, top left plan, shows you just the complexity of everyone fighting for use of the front courtyard. That's what all the arrows are. And so it's you as members, the mauve arrow, uh, conflicting with cars parking, conflicting with service access to the kitchens, conflicting with um, uh, other uses of the service yard and uh, service deliveries. Can we find a way of tidying that all up, making it, give, making it appear better? Raising the profile of the club in St. James's as, as absolutely the go-to beautiful and compelling historic club. The plans on the right, these are accessibility in, term, uh, in terms of making the club more accessible for members of um, all abilities, um, whether ambulant or not. And so pale green um, means the poorest accessibility at the moment, very difficult for the um, uh, accessibly challenged members to get to. The, the mid, mid green is better, more, more accessible actually, and only the dark green is completely accessible. Well, Francesca's and my challenge is to make almost the whole of Overseas House dark green. And we've already set about that. We have plans which we think can show to a great extent how that can be achieved. That's a, um, an absolutely massive target, target for us and for your executive. I know that for a fact. Well, okay, so just some quick headings. How do you go about this? Well, firstly, the um, yellow highlighted headings understand this chronology of change of overseas house and use that as a way of understanding how chronology can continue, how you can, 
continue to carry out change, but in a way which is not damaging past history. Be intelligent and be sensitive as to how you carry out change. And by carrying out that change, unlock the potential of Overseas House. And there is a great deal of potential to unlock in Overseas House, both in terms of enjoyment of the remarkable historical chronology, but also in terms of improving the offer. And that's what we mean by the next heading, enhance the way that building works. We can see how the offer can be improved, how greater and better facilities can be offered. And next heading down, we can see how through doing that, you can promote the architectural and historic and decorative significance of Overseas House. We can see how to conserve the fine historic fabric um, and, and really improve that in the presentation of uh, uh, enhancing your very, very fine interiors. And don't be uh, even slightly unsure about this. These buildings, these three buildings that you have, they are very important in statutory terms. We can find, we can work out how to greatly improve accessibility uh, in overseas house uh, for people of all abilities. We can find out how to renew the building infrastructure and Thomas Sikorsky is already getting on and starting that process, but you're going right back to the 1930s with this infrastructure at the moment. There's a heck of a long road to be traveled. There's a lot of work to do. It isn't gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take quite some doing. And finally, the most important point to me, make Overseas House the pride of the membership of the Royal Overseas League. You're already proud of it. With your executive, we can make you more proud of it. I guarantee you that. So we've flagged up a couple of case studies. I'm not going to take you through this whole list. There isn't time, but you can see the picture of your rotten entrance gates and they are actually falling apart. Beautiful 18th century gates, which have been badly dealt with um, in the not too recent past. I think in the 1960s, um, I beg your pardon, the 1980s and possibly in 2003 when the top floor was put on the Westminster Wing. Well, here are some sheets that we've been uh, producing, which together with written schedules of work have gone out to tender to contractors for works to put your entrance gates back into a condition that you can be proud of, that celebrates this fine building that you have. Now here's uh, roofing works, which we are teeing up again um, with your technical director of estates, Thomas Sikorsky. And uh, uh, we are, um, the, the coloured marking up is showing you different areas of concern with the condition of your roofs. The pale blue uh, oblong at the bottom left of that plan is um, the rotten slating that I showed you a, a horror slide of earlier. It's where the slates are falling off on one of the fourth floor bedroom roofs. So that's also out to tender at the moment to contractors. And with Thomas, we can get these contractors in and doing some urgent roofing works that can stop water coming in. Generally, the envelope of your building is in pretty good condition. It's pretty watertight, but there are some areas like that rotten slating and like some of the colors that we're flagging on this roof where water is actually physically coming in. We are absolutely going to stop that and deal with all the drainage issues, the rainwater drainage, getting water off your building. And so this is the last slide and this is the next steps which we're recommending to your executive and to you as a membership to undertake urgent conservation repairs to put the envelopes to, into good order, but second item down to understand undertake the absolutely essential works for legal compliance. Now this is in terms of the responsibility that the Royal Overseas League have in terms of health and safety and this is um, regarding um, electrical safety of course, uh, Legionella's water storage, asbestos and you've got some asbestos, it's 1937, 1950s, 1960s, everyone was using asbestos. Every single building that Francesca and I look at, even if we're told 
that the asbestos has been cleared by a contractor, we look again and it has not all been cleared. Well, you do have some asbestos, but Thomas Sikorsky is making sure that it's safe, it doesn't affect the members, and then he's removing it wherever and whenever he gets the opportunity. And at the end of a program of restoration works to overseas house, it will have all gone. Um, consultations with statutory authorities, well, this is Historic England, who's the um, government arm, who are responsible for grade one listed buildings, but also the local authority, the city of Westminster, who will give you listed building consent for alterations to your grade one listed building, advised by English Heritage. Then discussing development opportunities. So this is us, Francesca and I, coming as, as conservation architects and saying to your executive, well, look, have you thought about this? There's a possibility here. Could that be improved? Is there another way of doing this? And your executive coming to us and saying, do you know we'd really like to do this? We really want to improve how the restaurant works, how the kitchen uh, serves the, the restaurant and bar. And Francesca and I go away and we look at that. So it's a two-way street. So we, we look at development opportunities and that's a, an, an evolving piece of work. And then from all of that comes a um, defined and sustainable cost and business plan. And I know that your um, director general and your chief executive um, have every intention of coming to you as a membership with proposals once they have evolved and those proposals will be drawn from everything that I've just spent probably too long talking to you about it. I do hope you found that interesting. Diana. Thank you very much Martin, that was a, a really fascinating whistle-stop tour of some of the um, issues that we face, but also the opportunities. And I think we're all um, very encouraged or um, what's the right word, inspired by the, some of the thoughts that you've put forward about the heritage significance of the buildings and how we might reclaim more of that heritage in our plans going forwards. Um, I have had a couple of questions come in. Um, one was about the glass. You showed um, the stained glass in the arts office and the membership office. And I know you've done a lot of research on that glass. Can you just say, I know you've found the original makers of the glass, I think, didn't you? Oh, yes. And I wonder if Francesca might know who the name of um, the glass artist was. There is a conundrum here because we think the stained glass was des designed for overseas house. Um, we think that it was um, commissioned by um, uh, Sir Evelyn Wrench, who was an Ulsterman, um, but we think that it was somewhere else in overseas house to begin with, and it may have been in that room, which was a library, which is where your um, member's reception desk now is. It may have been in those windows opening onto the front courtyard. But um, uh, when, uh, possibly, when uh, Lord Hillingdon's architect, Ambrose Pointer, broke through uh, the new oak staircase, which he built for Lord Hillingdon, which you, which you all enjoy now as members, into that pre-existing library, it may be that that glass got moved then. Uh, Francesca, have you found that name? I'm not sure Francesca can... I think you may be, yeah, you may be um, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, um, yeah, I think it was Kluki of Belfast who has been able to replace That's... the window at that time, yes. So, Sorry, I'm not sure if this, this is the right pronunciation. But that is, uh, so this, this uh, we've actually spoken with Peter Kloki uh, who yeah. I think is is um, great grandfather uh, of the um, glass artist, glass artist who created these windows uh, probably for Sir Evelyn Wrench. 
But uh, Francesca reminds me, we did find out that um, the Cloakey Stained Glass Studios, which is still running in Belfast, um, refurbished the glass um, in the 1950s. That's right, Francesca, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yes, correct. That, yeah. that teaches us something because um, there's the glass, the, the refurbished glass has some odd pieces of glass in those heraldic devices, mm -hmm. the, the Ulster town heraldry. Um, and we couldn't understand this. It looked wrong. And it may be that some piece, glass pieces got broken over time in those heraldic devices and they were repaired by the Cloakey studio and some um, uh, not quite correct, let's say, pieces of glass got put in. So again, that's a lovely piece of chronology. That's why Francesca and I thoroughly enjoy the work that we do because you discover history in every single thing that you look at and that's a very good example. Uh, one thing you haven't mentioned, Martin, is the um, what we call the Copper Tower and we've had a question <laughs> come in about that. <laughs> what is the low rise curved building in the entrance court? And who right. designed it? And um, why is it there? So Francesca and I haven't alluded to the Copper Tower in the presentation and we haven't spoken about it because we don't like it. Um, <laughs> basically, um, the Copper Tower were, uh, was built in 2003 uh, when the top floor bedrooms um, when the top, uh, the top bedroom floor was added onto the Westminster Wing, that clever piece of light construction framing with a very gently vaulted uh, copper roof on it to throw the water off. And that is the top floor of the Westminster Wing. Um, and I can't remember the name of the architects, but they also designed and built the Copper Tower. And the Copper Tower was built just as some um, service offices um, for um, the catering operation. It's the, it's the kitchen office and it's now used, I think there's um, the, the, the sort of the estate team are in there, Diana, I'm not quite sure. It's, um, it's a catering and um, banqueting events teams that are in that's there. It. Mass, that's, yes. it. that's it. But it's a jolly peculiar building. Now I don't know who um, of, of the delegates this morning has raised the, raised the question and perhaps they like it very much and I'm, I'm probably thoroughly upsetting them. Um, but I think it's, it's um, a curious building and to our mind it does detract from the front courtyard but it may be something, it may be in the way that it's presented and it may be that we can find a way of improving the presentation of it. We've seen drawings from when it was designed and the drawings actually had curved planters for flowers and plants curving around the curved front of it. So the designers were trying to make it fit in in a, in a pleasing way. It, it's a very very hard working building and actually it's got the uh, paladin wheelie bins in an open area underneath it. Um, so it's it's fairly you know, it's fairly inauspicious in the way that it was designed to be used, but I think that we can work with this and Im and improve it. And there's even be been a comment made as to whether one could add a floor to it. Possibly, wouldn't that be interesting to try and add some additional sorely needed um, uh, accommodation? But that would be a very significant matter in in terms of statutory planning consent and we don't know Francesca and I yet whether that can be achieved or not we we, we just don't know yet. No and I, I know we do struggle with office spaces as well which is partly what that building provides is office spaces but maybe in the post-COVID-19 world that a need for extensive office spaces might change and also you know the way we do access and um, manage and move around buildings might change. So there's a lot to think about in all of this. Um, and um, someone's uh, asked a question is, how can I help? So um, I did oh, mention and emphasize the gates that Martin mentioned at the end of his um, presentation. 
that we are going out to tender at the moment to um, get the exact costs for repairing the gates and the restoration of them and the rehanging of them and repairs also to the gate piers. Um, and I remember my very first time I ever went to Rosal, which was for my interview, I was shocked at that very first impression you get yeah. when you arrive at those very dilapidated gates um, and also the tarmac and everything. But um, we are going to launch an appeal to members to us to help them support us in the costs that will be involved in the repair and conservation of these gates, which at the moment we don't know how much that will be, but it could be anything up to £20,000. So we will be launching an appeal on our website on the support in the support us section of the website and um, asking members to help us to um, repair and conserve the gates and, and get them back to their former splendor. I'm sure they were meant to be, um, you know, a really sort of splendid entrance to Vernon House, but also it's important that we can close them at night if we want to, or during the day if we need to. So it would be very much better I think for all of us if, if we had better control of that entrance area and we also could get the pedestrian gate working again. So those are some of the things that will be coming through for members but um, as Martin has shown there are many many projects coming coming along the line and our challenge now is to try and prioritise them into a timetable um, that might be realistic so that we know how much it is likely to cost over the next I don't know, it's at least three to five years, isn't it, Martin? Would you not yes. say? Yes, I, I can imagine. Yes, it could, it could easily be five years because these are, um, some of these works are pretty complex in terms of the fact that they affect every part of Overseas House, all three buildings in Overseas House. And so the, the implications are quite far reaching. It's, it, the work needs to be um, carefully planned, programmed, um, uh, it's quite invasive work, the infrastructure, the building services, the wiring, the pipe work and so on. Um, uh, and, and so the actually, the actually getting to it, opening up, um, is, is part of the problem. And we all always have that in the work that Francesca and I do. It's the opening up, which is the difficult bit. Mm. You have to open up. Uh, to get to it, which is a messy job. Now, quite how you program that um, as, as uh, in the context of a busily operating um, club uh, is, is the complexity, which means that you can't just go in there um, and crack on. It's got to be bit by bit, gently does it. Yes, and um, someone's just asking about the bins at the front entrance, and I think that's our problem, mm -hmm. is that we don't have a back entrance. We have a back and a front entrance at the moment, and so everything that you would normally have around the back of a building is actually at the front of our building. Someone else has asked about the gate into the park and why can't we use that, um, and I'm, I think members will appreciate that there's obviously a security risk with that gate, but also we're still negotiating our new lease with the Crown Estate for the garden um, and the question of an entrance into the park, which we currently don't have in our lease at the moment. So there is a bit more work to be done on the gate into the park, but it will never really be an alternative front entrance for Rosal and it won't overcome the problem of the bins. Um, Someone's asking about, will we be able to use the club while the restoration takes place? I, I would hope that we would be able to program the works in such a way that um, it can still be in use. And actually, often being able to see restoration happening and the conservation works can be a fascinating um, uh, experience for our members as well. I think to see the, the work in progress, the craftsmen at work, the the care and the attention to detail that goes into these sort of works. I think members will find that very interesting. Would you not agree, Martin? Uh, Diana, it's, it's very much the thing now uh, that whereas um, construction work used to be high, uh, hidden behind high hoardings, it's now um, considered by all right-minded, in my view, right-minded organisations, that uh, what's being carried out is actually part of the fascination. And, and um, 
I'm sure that the members would be very interested in the work that's being done um, and the work that uh, is being done and will be done is done by contractors um, uh, and this is the way that we do all of our work uh, a great deal of it is done by heritage contractors so these aren't um, people who just come in and uh, bash things to bits and put in a new one um, we start off with the concept that every every element of overseas house is precious and part of the history and we're looking to conserve repair and and better present it and so the contractors that we involve to do that are clever people they're actually mm -hmm. very skillful mm -hmm. very knowledgeable and and um they go about their work uh in in a way which is um uh in intended to well to to bring joy basically to 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 present everything as as beautifully and as meaningfully as possible these are clever people yes. um, so that so that too really contributes um to the um construction work operation and we have lots of experience francesca and i of of um having um contractors who um uh will entertain um a, a party of parties of visitors uh from the membership and interest groups to come and come and see what we're doing come and see why we find this so interesting come and see the materials that we're using these these materials haven't been used in this way since the 19th century or the 18th century um, so there's a lot of potential here for um, members really enjoying this process so yes. i would say yes absolutely um, overseas house can remain operational and it this is uh, uh, all part of the task that um, the executive and uh, the uh, buildings and heritage subcommittee um, uh, will be helping us and advising and guiding uh, us to help us understand how this can be done in a way which allows uh, the operation of the Overseas League to continue. Thank you, Martin. And I'm, I think that you're absolutely right. It will be a really fantastic way for members to um, understand what's happening, but also to really be inspired by the quality of the work that's being undertaken and to be proud of their clubhouse and the, the great care that, and attention that's going into its restoration. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of members are asking what more can they do to help or how can they be more involved and um, apart from uh, helping the funding side of it um, I'm not sure apart from the only other thought I had was maybe if someone had a an old photograph or something that we haven't seen before in relation really to the interiors very that good be useful for us if anyone members have been members for three generations so if there is any um, photos of overseas house in use over the decades that might be useful but um, that's and indeed like and indeed recollections as yeah. well it, it yeah. can, can be um, uh, sort of audible history yes uh, Diana there's one thing which I'm really interested in at the moment um, and we've had a discussion recently about um, the drawing room ceiling Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you're going to repaint the drawing room ceiling, um, then do we um, attenuate the colour slightly, um, make it a slightly more historic colour? And so it's anything that people can remember, uh, have recollection of in terms of schemes of, dec of decoration which have, uh, which they remember but have been lost. That would be yeah. terrifically interesting, actually, and immensely helpful. Yes. Well, um, thank you. I don't think we've got any questions that we haven't answered. I'm just checking. Um, someone's saying, could we have architecturally focused tours of the building? Uh, yes. um, particularly sorry. if you've seen, seen all your rooms, uh, sorry, all your photographs and plans. I think they would like to be able to see that, you know, on the ground as well. So, um, and someone else is asking, can we get grants for any parts of this work? Um, that is certainly something that we're looking into in terms of grant funding. 
not being a charity, it's not so easy for Rosal, um, but we can, we are certainly looking at particularly um, trusts and foundations. And obviously if any member has any links to any trusts and foundations who specialize in supporting heritage um, projects or architectural projects, then we'd be very glad to hear from them. Um, so I think we've covered most things now, Martin. Was there anything else that you particularly wanted to add or if Francesco has got anything that she feels she wants to add as a final comment, that would be fine. Uh, not for me, Diana. I've thoroughly enjoyed this morning. Thank you very much. Well, I think it only remains for me then to say thank you to both of you um, for a really informative presentation, which we will put on our website so people have a chance to look at it again if they wish, or those who weren't able to attend today can also see it. And also our, our staff, of course, um, because it's about pride in the clubhouse for our staff as well as our members. And as I mentioned, we will be putting the details of the Gates um, Gate Peers appeal on our website. So do check that out. And um, thank you all of you for attending the webinar this morning. I think we've had more than 70 people involved. So that's really fantastic for our first webinar. And if you haven't already signed up for the AGM and the EGM, please consider doing so. We want as many members as possible to be part of that. So I'll just finish by saying thank you very much, Martin and Francesca for everything that you've shared with us today. Thank you. Very great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Really a pleasure. Thank you.